Welcome Forever Buffs, alumni, faculty, staff, and current students. Thank you for joining us for this exciting installment of CU Boulder's Forever Buffs Spotlight Series. The Forever Buffs Spotlight Program highlights alumni, students, faculty, and staff that exemplify the Colorado Creed and who make a positive impact in their industry or their community. This program aims to build connections with CU Boulder and the community that we are all a part of. If you are in need of closed captioning, please click down below on the bottom right, the CC button located in the toolbar. Tonight's event is brought to you by the CU Boulder Alumni Association, CU Boulder Career Services, The Herd, which is our student alumni, our student alumni association, and the School of Education, Leeds School of Business and the College of Engineering and Applied Science. As we gather, we honor and acknowledge that the University of Colorado's four campuses are on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, Lakota, Pueblo, and Shoshone nations. Further, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that comprise what is now called Colorado. Acknowledging that we live in the homelands of indigenous peoples recognizes the original stewards of these lands and their legacies. With this land acknowledgement, we celebrate the many contributions of native peoples to the fields of medicine, mathematics, government, and military service, arts, literature, engineering, and more. We also recognize the sophisticated and intricate knowledge systems indigenous peoples have developed in relationship to their lands. We recognize and affirm the ties these nations have to their traditional homelands and the many indigenous people who thrive in this place alive and strong. We also acknowledge the painful history of ill treatment and forced removal that has had a profoundly negative impact on Native nations. We, we respect the many diverse Indigenous peoples still connected to this land. We honor them and we thank that the, the Indigenous ancestors, ancestors of this place. The University of Colorado pledges to provide educational opportunities for Native students, faculty, and staff, and advance our mission to understand the history and contemporary lives of Native peoples. Before I introduce our panelists, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Jennifer Duncan, and I am the Program Manager for Alumni Career Services at CU Boulder. Let's start with CU alum, Tony Christensen, who graduated in 1971 with a degree from the School of Education. Tony? Yes, uh, may I first uh, thank the sponsors and the organizers of this uh, program, because I am honored to be here with such talented panelists and yourself, Jennifer, as well as others, Haley. Um, it is indeed a pleasure and an honor to be a CU alum. I think what's important, I, uh, my name is Tony Christensen. I work uh, with the company now as a partner in the Global Core Partners. We have uh, activities primarily in Africa. But I think what's more important is when you say what better way to impact, uh, impact humanity abroad than through education and diplomacy. My undergraduate uh, studies were in education, as I mentioned, and also distributive international studies. Both of these really furthered and advanced my career goals. Uh, for example, I started as a curriculum advisor, as a secondary teacher then went on to join the US Agency for International Development as a Foreign Service Education Officer, and ultimately served in the private sector as a CEO and as a general manager in the Middle East and in Central Asia. So my career goals, again, were well served by my studies at CU. The 70s were really known as a pivot of change, and I think we can certainly apply that even today. Um, at that time, you had anti-Vietnam, and anti-Vietnam sentiments on campus. You had activist groups. You had um, a lot of uh, misinformation, disinformation, uh, diverse opinions. But what really captured my attention was a detente with the Soviet Union. 
Uh, as a result of courses from a, a very well-known professor at Boulder, Edward Rozek, I took many Eastern European and Soviet classes. And from that, I really wanted to gain firsthand knowledge. So I studied in the Soviet Union and then learned more about the history, the culture and the diverse opinions that were, that were being pro uh, were propagandized at that time. From there, I thought it was important to impact how teachers teach. And so I applied for a Fulbright and went to India as a Fulbright scholar, working on a curriculum that would, um, for American teachers, to present different cultural, uh, to present cultural differences and diversities uh, in the context of India. So uh, this was really the beginning of a 35 year career of learning, of working, of living and traveling in over 95 countries, uh, focusing on economic development, on private sector growth and education and training. That's wonderful. Thank you, Tony, for giving us that background and a little bit about yourself um, and what you've experienced so far. Um, next, we're joined by Maggie Grout, who graduated in 2021 with a degree in business from the Leeds School of Business. Maggie, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, yes, I am the founder and CEO of Thinking Huts, which is a nonprofit that seeks to increase access to education by building 3D printed schools. Um, yes, I recently graduated, um, though my journey did start in high school, so I wouldn't say um, it's directly linked to university, but CE Boulder definitely expanded my thoughts on why that education access is so necessary. I was part of CSER and did the SRE certificate. So I would say those are what really directly impacted me um, at my time at, in the university. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Our third panelist is Maitre Gopala Christian, Gopala Krishnan, and she is a graduate of the class of 2016 with a degree in engineering. Maitre, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks so much, Jen, for the introduction. And um, thank you to all of the organizers um, and really and all of the other two panelists here and the amazing work they're doing as well. I'm excited to learn more about what you're doing. So um, a bit about me, my name is Maitre and I graduated in 2016 from University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I'm currently the uh, founder and CEO of a very early stage um, financial technology startup called Liquidify um, and trying to uh, essentially make access to a very, very large, um, but very um, kind of confusing to navigate um, market, which is the bond market. And it really finances um, globally um, a lot of the infrastructure um, of, of, that we use on a daily basis, um, but there's just not a lot of, um, I guess, like regular investor access um, to this market. So just trying to expand that. Um, but what took me abroad initially, um, and I think what I'll refer to a lot today in, in this panel, is the first um, startup that I founded while a student at CU, um, and it was called Studio Conversions, and we were um, aiming to convert auto rickshaws in India and other countries around the world um, to be hybrid powered. Um, energy technology has always been um, a passion of mine, um, and you know, utilizing clean technology to really have an impact on um, humanity across the world. And so that was something that was really passionate um, that I was really passionate about. And I think my time at CU really shaped my passion for social impact startups um, and that world and how um, fascinating it can be to kind of understand how to develop a profitable business that's also um, really, really prioritizing um, the immediate needs of people all around the world. Um, so that was really the biggest thing for me. Um, and it also just developed my time at CU developed my network tremendously. And wow. so there's people that I worked with at Surya, um, people that I've met, you know, um, at school after I graduated that I've stayed in touch with and that have helped me tremendously through my startup journey, even um, with what I'm working on now. And so I'm greatly appreciative for um, all of the opportunities I had and people I met um, my time there and beyond. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much. Oh, this is going to be exciting. I'm welcome, everyone. We're thrilled to have you all here. Um, we're thrilled for our audience to be here and listening. We'd like to know a little bit more about our audience. So we're going to post 
that's our first poll question. And so before we get into that impacting humanity abroad, take a moment, if you would, and answer this poll question regarding what your affiliate affiliation is to CU. So go ahead, if you would, and answer. We'll give you a few, few seconds. We know that we usually have alumni, many alumni, but students, faculty, staff, and, and friends of CU as well. So we'd love to know um, who is joining us this evening. Okay, we're gonna go, go ahead and close that poll. And now the overwhelming majority is alumni, 64% are alums. We do have 27% uh, faculty staff, 9% students. So um, that's wonderful. I always think that it's great to be able to hear from our alumni to, to hear what career paths they've had and, and where those paths have led them. So let's get into a little bit more of that. Need to find my questions again. Here we go. Oh no, we have a couple more polls actually. Sorry. Um, next poll: Do you work in the private sector, public sector, with a nonprof or an NGO, or with an international organization? Please take a few seconds to answer this question. We're already hearing from some of you in the chat, which is great. Okay, it looks like the majority of you are in the public sector, 38%. And then equal distribution between private sector and nonprofit NGO, 25% each there. And then 13% international organizations. So that's wonderful. All right, I think we have a third poll. Yes. What brings you to this event? Why did you decide to join us this evening? So I'll let you take a moment, answer. There's three different options there. If for some reason it's other for you, you can let us know that in the chat. Okay, wonderful. Let's see what we've got there. Oh my goodness, 88% of you are interested in pursuing a career to impact humanity for the positive. Uh, and 13% 13 of you are currently in a career abroad doing work to positively impact humanity. Great, wonderful. We do have a fourth question for you, but this time we're gonna ask that you use the chat to um, answer the question. So the question is in the chat, what sectors of development are you most interested in? Um, certainly not limited to, but for instance, infrastructure development, climate sustainability, health, education, or other. Let us know in your own words, um, what sectors of development you are interested in. I see education, corporate education. Others, health, all, great. Global education and youth empowerment, absolutely. Education, empowerment, wonderful. Keep them coming in. Anything that helps the environment. That's great. Yes. And I think all of our panelists um, are gonna be able to touch on some of these things. So wonderful. Thank you so very much for answering those. That does give us a little bit to work with. Okay. Now, I, I, hang on just one moment. Okay, so we're going to start with our first question. 
We're, I'm going to ask about four questions of the panel, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Okay. So first off, I'd like to hear from each of you what kind of preparation was required, if any, to make the move to do work in another country. And um, would any of you like to jump in? <laughs> Or shall I just call on each of you? Tony, let's start with oh, you. Okay, good. Generally to move abroad, you need to have a, a really deep understanding of the culture, the language, the, uh, the context in which you're moving to, and the specific location, because countries can be very different from one area to another, for example, in India. And then there needs to be a willingness really to learn, to have expectations challenged, and at the same time be humble in terms of how you uh, receive the, the, the uh, feedback and the misinformation if you have it. Uh, for example, if you're applying for the foreign service, when I was applying at least, you had to have at least a level language, uh, language capability of a level below an interpreter. You had to have area studies at the Diplomatic Institute. And then you were also an intern for a year or less in Washington and then at the post where you were going. So this were, were very specific requirements. At the post then you also have additional requirements in terms of post risks, threats, security, and things like that. Uh, for the private sector, it's a bit different. When you're moving abroad, your preparation really starts at the company headquarters and you need a scope of work. You need to know what position you have in the company. And then from there, you can determine what research you need to become informed and be able to be value added to the company because a company really wants to hire people that are going to be able to, to increase the business, to provide profit margins and things of that nature. So it's not, it's not uh, foreign service is different. You have a budget in the foreign service. The private sector, you're looking for a budget or you're looking mm -hmm. for the bottom line. So it's, it's really different. So you need to know how to do business planning, how to do budgeting, how to evaluate and how to um, and look for opportunities in the business world. Um, having a business solution with trusted implementing project or strategic partners that are um, that can help you provide a winning proposal that with competitive pricing is critical too in the private sector. So most recently I worked on a contract uh, to train women entrepreneurs. It required a knowledge of the audience. I had to know what, what level of education they had, what language they spoke. And also I had to learn the technical skills required so that I could sequence uh, the different curriculum areas for them to learn, um, simplify concepts and make it, uh, make it interesting, if you will. Um, the challenge really was writing a curriculum that would be culturally acceptable. And at the same time, you would be able to translate it into other languages to have the same meaning that, that I was trying to, to uh, write in English. So these were, uh, were real challenges. Secondly, there was a, a prime vendor for food contract. And this was in the private sector to supply food to um, troops in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, sorry, in Iraq, uh, Kuwait, and Jordan. And you need to know the dietary requirements. You need to know the supply chain, the transportation, all of the budgeting um, and the multimodal ways of getting this to your client. So you have to have a very clean sense of your source your supplies, the quality, the quantity, and whether or not it can be delivered on time. So public and private sector are quite different in those aspects, but you have to be prepared to join either one. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, my tray, we're going to go with you next. Tell us a little bit from your perspective. Yeah. Um, and Tony, I'm learning so much from you as well. So this is wonderful. Um, but yeah, for for myself, it was it was rather different because you know most of my family actually lives in India, and I go back to visit quite often. And so I I kind of grew up spending a lot of my summers there, and so I was quite familiar in some ways with the culture. Um, but you know when you're going there to visit family. Um, it's a very different context um, in which you're approaching, you know, working with people abroad um, versus when you're actually out kind of in the field um, speaking with, with the customers that you're serving or the people that you're serving. And so uh, for me, I think it was, it was just a lot of like kind of due diligence and just being with a few, I want to say like um, 
friendlies in a way, but people that were kind of in that industry that I was working in. So um, rickshaw drivers that we had gone on rickshaw rides with um, a number of times. And mm -hmm. so I had that level of comfort in speaking candidly with them um, to get some familiarity with what the priorities of rickshaw drivers in general were. Um, and then for myself, like I knew that if I just went out and talked to rickshaw drivers on my own, it would be it would be a really rough experience um, because so one I speak a different dialect so um, as Tony mentioned the language aspect is really really important um, being prepared to actually go and interact with the people um, that you're serving and then um, just kind of getting familiar with what those um, cultural differences are how people interact differently um, based on you know, what roles they have in society there and in um, and, and a lot of other areas. So, so what I actually did when I went to talk with rickshaw drivers is I um, brought my cousin along who grew up there and was very familiar with the, the culture and how to interact with rickshaw drivers. And so that helped a lot in just kind of getting conversations started. Um, so just having some of that preparation, like having people that you know, um, maybe going on trips there beforehand before you're actually doing your work there and just um, acclimatizing yourself with the culture um, can be very, very helpful um, and impactful in ensuring that you're getting um, kind of the most value out of the experience, so yeah. That's great, thank you. Maggie, tell us a little bit about you and preparation, if any, that you, uh, that you had. From a nonprofit perspective, I think it's important to start with asking, am I really needed here? Especially working within school construction, I think you really need the community buy-in. And that's what really shaped uh, selecting our first location that we're hoping to build our school in. And um, just knowing that they are excited and support what you're doing. I think you have to be aware of this too, because you need to think of solutions um, that also think about how many jobs you can create locally too, because I think that's a lot of the problems that you will see within the international development space with the whole like white saviorism and parachuting um, topics that tend to come in. So just making sure you're aware of that, I think is the most important thing that I um, definitely thought about a lot before um, going into that. Can you speak a little more, just a little bit more to that, Maggie, in terms of preparation with, with, with those last two things you mentioned, or the last thing that you mentioned? Of course. So um, how I addressed that was forming local partners. So we have a university partner um, where we are getting all of the insights into the community and making sure that this is something that they would accept and also that they would think is a long term solution, because that was something I am very passionate about creating sustainable uh, solutions, both on the environment side, but also it can live on like without additional like external aid. You want them to be able to look after it and feel ownership over um, something, especially if you're working with school construction. That's great. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, second question. What was it like to adjust once you arrived or once you arrived at your destination? Um, even if you were with family, um, tell us a little bit about that. What, and what challenges did you face? So I'm going to go back to Tony again. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, well, I, the, as you mentioned, there are two types of adjustment. One is personal and one is professional. So resettling a family overseas requires lots of different, uh, uh, you know, engagements, challenges, and trying to find the right schools, spousal employment, uh, health, uh, just all shops, where to go. Uh, it, it requires a lot, but the personal and professional things sometimes blend together. And then you really need to manage expectations and adjustments because um, they both are intertwined. On the professional side, in countries um, where you have experience, there's a, a lesser learning curve, but you still may have staff, you may have different uh, counterparts and also a different tasks to perform there. So you have to be equally as, as astute in terms of learning how to adjust to those. 
uh, getting to know more about your points, uh, getting to know more about a subject in terms of points of view, in terms of meeting stakeholders and community development people, and then being able to synthesize that information and put it into a project that will actually be, be viable is what's really important. Uh, for example, youth employment, someone mentioned that earlier, is one of the key topics of today. And ensuring a recommendation and a negotiating point in a foreign country um, in order to get a position that would be accepted by your counterparts is really critical. And in some cases, in one in particular, um, it was a, a vocational technical project that really wasn't going to be successful from the beginning because it was based on uh, old government uh, uh, voc tech schools that really didn't have the tools, the equipment or the technologies to, uh, to prepare youth for modern uh, employment. And so the, the challenge was to get them either involved in the project or to um, sidetrack them and maybe look for other alternatives. In order to be able to be successful when you're dealing with ministries and others, you look for options where they can be actually folded into the project and become more uh, viable in terms of their options and the way that they approach in, in, um, employment, especially through more direct contact with the private sector because the private sector is where the demand is. So you want to really gear your training and your, uh, your um, your course offerings to what the private sector needs so that then you can uh, get them gainfully employed. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, Maitre, let's go to you next. Yeah, um, so some of the challenges, I guess when I when I arrived um, in India to really um, work um, in full on this project, um, the the biggest challenges or some of the biggest challenges I faced were, um, for example, internet <laughs> is something that yeah. that you have to you can't take for granted. Um, and and so thinking about all of those things that you have to do beforehand because you know that when you're getting on a video call, like um, some of the engineering team was here, and to be able to you know think about how I'd install this brick um this hybrid conversion kit on a rickshaw and um, there were some things that I wasn't fully aware of and needed an engineer um, the help of an engineer who was here um, for some of that work and so I had to do a lot of preparation beforehand and understanding um, to ensure that I could kind of limit um, the amount that I'd have to depend on those video calls um, and really get myself prepared from that standpoint um, and then challenges. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me or the biggest, I guess, realization for me was the second that I started talking to rickshaw drivers. Um, I very, very quickly realized that the priorities that I had formed in my mind that I assumed would be their priorities, like having just kind of understood from an outsider standpoint, like what their challenges were, um, were very different than the way that they thought about things. So like I, I thought, you know, they would be excited to talk about an opportunity that would help them to save a lot of, um, you know, fuel um, costs in the long term. Um, I figured that, you know, the environment and improving the pollution problem there wasn't necessarily one of their top concerns, but um, that that it would be something on their mind possibly. And then when I got there and I started talking to rickshaw drivers, I realized wow, just me going and talking to them, um, it felt like I was actually taking time away from them to go and find rides, right? And make money because for a lot of rickshaw drivers in India, it's, you know, their day, their day to day job is what is providing food for their families, giving them the money to provide for their families. And so the concept of thinking about future gains or future savings is, is not a concept that um, that they necessarily think about at all. Um, and so that was a really, really different perspective coming in and challenge um, that, that I faced and, and really a huge learning opportunity. Um, and I think it's part of what kind of guided me to the approach I'm taking now, um, which is more, you know, seeing the profitability coming in from, um, from those who are thinking more about what those long-term savings look like, and then taking some of those proceeds and donating it to the people that 
you know, can't necessarily think about that and have to be putting food on the table for their families. So, so it really shifted my perspective on, on how to impact humanity abroad. Um, and it's not necessarily going directly to the people who I'm trying to impact, um, whose lives I'm trying to impact. Um, so, so that was uh, definitely something I realized when I got there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes things are unexpected and we learn as we go, right? That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Maggie, let's hear from you. What was it like uh, to adjust um, once you were there? Or what challenges did you face? I actually have a bit of a different perspective. Um, since I have a local team there, we were remote even before the pandemic, so it wasn't that much of a change. Um, so they get all the credit for the work that's done on the ground. Um, we're mainly responsible for the fundraising side of things. Um, I think in terms of challenges, I would say most of it has been faced with the pandemic because we were planning for our pilot to, to be launched in Madagascar, but the travel borders are still closed, so we can't transport the printer. So we're not really sure when we'll actually be able to build it, but still doing all of the work behind the scenes and they're working on what can be done traditionally um, with like foundations and stuff like that. Um, I would say other challenges would definitely be time differences. Um, Madagascar, <laughs> a very big time block. Got to get up super early or be up really late trying to figure that out. And then going off of the internet point as well, um, a lot of people just don't have that infrastructure in place there. Um, the local team we do have has to walk to an internet cafe. I think that's something we take for granted here a lot as well. We can just jump on a Zoom call, but they might have to walk a bit further to even have access to a computer. Yeah, you're right. Those those are some things we do take for granted. And so, yeah. Uh, what is the time difference between here and Madagascar, between the states and Madagascar? I think for me, it's about eight hours. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> that does make a difference in our work for sure. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next question. The question is, what steps did you take to make sure you were coming into the communities responsibly and respectfully? And I think some of you have touched on that a bit, but let's dive in a little deeper there. So, Tony, I'm going to I'm go ready. Again. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, one, of the, one of the key elements is to engage and involve the local communities. Uh, by getting the local communities uh, involved, uh, interested in the project and actually participating in the project and the stakeholders as well. You can garner their support and you can also have them as advocates for the project. So it's really important to have local staff again that speaks the local language, that understands the nuances of the culture and other things so that they can guide you and so that the project will be successful because otherwise, um, like uh, you just don't know what what will happen with it. Um, an example I think that was very uh, productive and creative was in uh, Sesame Street in Egypt, for example. That was one thing that USAID uh, financed. And it was very successful because the characters, the local company produced it. The uh, artists were local. The actors were all local. The puppets were dressed in local costumes and they had local names. And so their big bird was a little bit different than our big bird, but still it was a big, it was a big bird. So I think it's important that uh, we build capacity of the local companies. And in that way, we're also extending the idea of employment, of training, and of knowledge, because knowledge and technology are all very important in this. Um, I found as a foreigner, though, it was important for me to um, have interpersonal skills, technical and management skills that were sensitive to the location and that really had a respect for local customs and norms. I think if you show that uh, um, humble attitude and you approach projects and, and your counterparts as equals and uh, you design projects that will then, uh, you are able to design projects that are much more acceptable and that will be uh, something that they are looking forward to participating in. Um, an example again was recently I was a chaperone for a group of eight women going to India to study in Jaipur at the Arch uh, Institute of Design and Business. Normally these women have to have a chaperone to travel. But I think being grandma, um, I was able to take the ladies by myself to India along with a learning specialist. 
And again, it's an example of trust and confidence. And I think you need to build that trust and confidence with the communities, with the stakeholders, and work with them to accomplish the project or, or company objectives. That's great. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I recently saw that uh, the Sesame Street thing um, uh -huh. uh, feature on it. And yeah, and it just, yeah, because they 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 incorporated in, into the community with the customs, with the the names of the children and the puppets. Yeah, it, it was. A and it's not only literacy, it's general knowledge. Mm -hmm. We found that uh, they would show it in the afternoon and that the, the adults would come in to see it as well. So in some cases where they were illiterate, perhaps, or had basic literacy, they would also begin to become literate through Sesame Street. Wow, that's great. Yeah. 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 Okay. My Trey, let's go to you next. Tell us a little bit about, um, yeah, the steps that you took for going into those communities responsibly and respectfully. Yeah. Um, as Tony mentioned, um, having that local connection is absolutely key. And so when I went in there, I mentioned that I brought my cousin with me to start um, those interactions with rickshaw drivers. Um, when talking about the engineering side of things, I actually contacted or maybe the professor contacted me, but I got in touch with a professor who was um, in an engineering institution in India, in South India, which is where I'm from. And, um, and so I had been exchanging messages with him and kind of talking with him and a couple of other people who he was working with on kind of a similar project, um, electrifying rickshaws. And so when I arrived there, that was one of the things that I did is I went and visited and I kind of understood um, from their perspective because they're local. They really see this problem day in and day out, which I don't um, being here. And so it was really, really helpful to have that connection and that partnership with them because they opened my eyes right away to issues that I probably wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And so I think um, really being open to um, having people in the local community guiding you through the process and really ensuring that they feel like they have some, some kind of ownership or co-ownership in mm -hmm. that process is really, really important. Um, so you feel like, or you know, they don't feel like you're you're going in and then you're just kind of projecting your ideals of what that community should be like on them, but you're really including them in the decision-making process. I think that's really key. Yeah, and did you find then that they were a little bit more vested in your idea or in in um, working with you? On, Absolutely. On, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, it wasn't just you know, them telling me a little bit about what they've learned necessarily, but we were truly partnering um, and, and trying to see how we could actually like, do business together um, with a partner in the United States that has resources of a different sort and then a partner in India that has resources of a different sort and that local perspective. Um, so having that was really, really critical. Um, and I think people were more receptive knowing that there was that partnership in place. That's great, yeah. Maggie, now I know your situation is a little different, but what steps did you take to make sure that you were maybe say meeting those communities responsibly and respectfully, even via Zoom or, or what have you? I think I echo the same sentiments about approaching it um, like you are equals. I think there's a tendency also within the nonprofit world to view it like us versus them. And I think that's something that definitely needs to change um, because I think at the heart of it, it needs to be an empowering solution. Um, like everyone was saying before, you are trying to include the communities and it really should be local rather than thinking about you first. You have to think about how it would impact them. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Let's go to the next question, which is, what do you, well, it's kind of a two-parter or three-parter. What do you know now that you wished you had known then? What lessons have you learned? And what do you recommend for others going into the same kind of environment? And Tony, let's go to you. Let's go. Um, 
certainly introducing new ideas in either the public or the private sector domain, uh, that requires, again, you have to know the context, you have to know what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, really, you need to know to the current events, the risks, the strategies, and then the tactics. How are you going to accomplish this? Uh, not fully understanding management styles, not fully understanding the social fabric of a country, and really not knowing uh, local languages, as we've mentioned previously, are all impediments and can, uh, can be detractors in your ability to get something done. Uh, one thing you have to do is be prepared for setbacks. There are going to be uh, many things that, that are not acceptable. So then you have to be flexible and focus on how you can then come up with a business solution or a project solution that will meet the requirements that you have and at the same time uh, uh, focus on the communities and the stakeholders and the participants and what they need. And then find a couple more points, um, just ensuring compli compliance and accountability at the local level, uh, the legal uh, requirements uh, for local, for regional or country, and especially if you're going to be importing or exporting for the United States, what are those kinds of uh, compliance requirements? So those are things that you have to take on a broader scale. Uh, do you need to inform someone uh, what kind of phytosanitary requirements are there for products, even clothes, if you will? And then in designing a, a project, always consider the demand side, not the supply side. Look for, for example, in training unemployed youth, as I mentioned previously, what are the areas where there is employment? How do you train them to the level of employment that's required? And then how do you get them the job? And that requires the interface between private sector, public sector, policy, as well as then um, the ability to, to have these people gainfully employed. Um, finally, then I think there's a question of so what? So what is the impact? And that requires you to look at the output, not the input for the project. What is the, who are the beneficiaries? How many people will be included? What is the economic benefit in terms of economic development or in our um, country development? Um, so you need to look at what is the benefit for the overall population, the economy, and perhaps even the country if it's a large scale project that's macroeconomic. That's great, thank you. My tray, let's go to you. Yeah, um, so I think um, the, the biggest kind of lessons that I learned um, that I think have applied to many other areas um, of my career um, after studio conversions and with what I'm doing now. Um, so two things, um, unique financing methods and, um, and then knowing who you're serving and who your customer is before you do anything else, like absolutely anything else. Um, so the mistake that I had made um, candidly was um, kind of coming up with, with this idea, got getting really excited and getting a lot of reinforcement here um, in the United States about um, how much of an impact this idea can make and not really realizing the intricacies of what we could face um, in India. And so it was a little bit later on that I actually like truly, truly realized what the needs of um, rickshaw drivers were um, and the needs of the people that I was trying to help. And so that was a, a major realization for me um, where I, I wish that I had, you know, right as soon as I had come up with this idea, flown straight to India and talk to every single rickshaw driver that I could find over you know, the course of however long I was there um, to really, really hone in on, on what their needs were and what you know, challenges they faced um, and how to kind of work around that. So, so that's kind of the, the customer or I guess like user mm -hmm. experience kind of aspect of things um, that I've really taken into account with, with my current startup where the first thing I did was put out a survey to a ton of people and talk to a ton of people before I even started developing the product. Um, so that was one big um, thing. And then the other thing was um, financing. As I mentioned, um, people who are, I mean, a lot of the, the rickshaw drivers I spoke with um, there they, they didn't really have this perspective long-term thinking and investing for something in the future. Um, but there are you know, other people around that, that do have that sort of thinking. And so 
um, who is the right person to go to for the financing and how can you think about creatively financing something that is still helping um, the people that, that may not be able to pay directly for what you're offering. And um, so there's a lot of uh, really, really unique ways that, that can be done. Um, one that I wish that I had pursued from the very beginning um, was speaking with kind of local governments and seeing what kind of subsidy options could be available on the ground um, to help to finance these kits because it is in the best interest of cities, states, um, and all of India to reduce um, or to, to improve the pollution problem there because it's it's really severe and significant. Um, and so they they really had a vested interest in their own way um, to to support um, an initiative like what I had. Um, but that was something that we kind of thought about later, a different financing method. Um, and so in hindsight, you know, I would have thought of that um, ahead of time or or started um, kind of pursuing that angle ahead of time. And um, that's definitely what I'm what I'm doing now um, because it, it really makes a, a big difference in how much impact you can have. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Maggie, let's go to you. Lessons learned. What do you know now that you wish you'd done then? A lot of things. Um, <laughs> I cannot put it all in there, but I would say the main one would be ask for help earlier on. I think um, being on the younger side too, I faced a lot more challenges of people taking me seriously and people would just assume I did not know what I was talking about, even though I put in the work and I <laughs> am almost up to seven years just working on this. So I think that's the biggest challenge I would say. Um, finding mentors earlier on who can help you get through the setbacks because um yeah like tony was saying you're gonna meet a lot of them and it's gonna be hard to like bounce back in the beginning but it does get easier over time and i would probably also tell myself that governments are very bureaucratic it's not gonna move as fast as you want so you gotta be patient yeah that's great thank you Okay, now I'd like us to move to the Q&A portion of our evening, and we've got some time to take questions. I know that uh, I think there maybe have been some coming in already, so let's do a quick check and um, see what we've got. Okay. First question, and this is for really any of you, um, do you or did you travel back and forth a lot? Was there travel, a lot of travel involved or has there been a lot of travel involved? Any of you wanna take that question? I will. Sure. Yes, um, totally. when you're when you're posted overseas, there's not as much travel. When you're in Washington, there's a lot of travel in the Foreign Service. But then if you're working under contract, sometimes your contracts require you to work uh, partially in the States and then partially in the field. And so that way you, you do have a lot of travel. Um, I lived in Dubai. I had to travel a lot to Afghanistan and to the Central Asia to uh, um, Kurdistan is uh, not Kurdistan, sorry, Kazakhstan and other places. Um, in addition, I was in Jordan and had to travel to Iraq, um, all over the Middle East. So it depends on the type of work you're doing. But yes, there is a lot of travel normally. Yeah, I, I definitely had to travel back and forth. Um, one of the unique circumstances that I uh, that we faced as a team pretty early on was that um, rickshaws have a uh, pretty poor fuel efficiency and they don't meet the fuel efficiency standards in the United States. So we were thinking, oh, we'll just import a rickshaw somehow. Um, we somehow managed to get our hands on a rickshaw, one of the last rickshaws in the United States. I don't know how we did that, um, but it was, it was just a very fortunate um, circumstance. So we were able to do quite a bit of development here, um, but to really actually see the typical rickshaw that's used there, which is um, with a two-stroke engine, um, we did have to go um, to India and to develop or to actually see the rickshaws there. Um, so that was that was a really um, kind of necessary reason, I guess, that we had to go back and forth quite a bit. Um, and of course, you know, the people that we were helping and we were serving were there. So um, so it made a lot of sense. But yeah, I definitely did travel back and forth. Yeah. 
Meg, know that you um, things have kind of of um, the pandemic has has put a kink in some things, but previously, um, can you talk speak to the travel a little bit? Yeah, for me, I did not experience a lot of travel. I think since it was still remote at that time, and I I trust my team to do the work on the ground. Mm -hmm. That I don't think I really encountered that very much. Um, but perhaps in the future, I will if we do expand to other countries. I'm not quite sure, um, but we would probably try to replicate the model to then also have a local team there. That's great. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> If you could give one piece of advice to, to a student that is interested in this sort of work, what would it be? And any of you could jump in first. I would say a volunteer for people or organizations that you would be interested in because that's the only way you would really know if that's the right fit for you. Because maybe you don't want to do a nonprofit, but you're you're really pulled to the cause. So you find out what you're interested in working in, but then you maybe work in a, a different industry, but you're still getting that experience. And um, I think a lot of times you could also help those organizations too by giving them a new perspective. Could I just add to that too? There are, there are internships that you can apply for um, for many international organizations. And they're looking for uh, youth, they're looking for young blood and things. So I would look and explore options with the, even State Department has in, in, internships. So if you're interested, it depends on if it's private sector or public sector, but many companies offer the same. So just begin exploring and looking for those opportunities. Um, and I'd say just traveling, I mean, just getting that experience of being abroad and immersing yourself in another culture and learning what that really means. Because I think, um, you know, a lot of times we'll, we'll take a vacation to another place. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing is, is very much in a bubble and very touristy and we're staying with the people that we've come with and we're not um, necessarily, this is a generalization, but not necessarily immersing ourselves fully in the community. And so really understanding what that means and what it takes. Um, so go and spend time. Well, it's easy to say now with COVID and all of the, the restrictions here um, now, but in general, um, just going and spending time in other um, cultures and other communities. Um, and I think there's also, you know, in addition to certain types of work or certain industries that you'll gravitate towards naturally, you may also gravitate to certain um, cultures, right? Um, cultures that you just, whose values you really resonate with. And so that um, is a really, you know, just traveling and having that experience um, is, is a really great way to find out um, where it is that you want to be located and where you want to work as well. If I could just jump in real quick, I'd like to, given what you all have just spoken about, I'd like to plug a couple of things that we have for students and for alumni. Um, Handshake, which is something that Career Services offers Handshake is also, also shows up on the Forever Buffs network. Both of those two resources are going to be excellent in terms of being able to find a mentor, whether it's just a, a single conversation or long-term mentoring or somebody who can open doors for you. That's, what the forever, that's foreverbuffsnetwork.com and students, alumni, um, faculty, staff can join that. Um, parents of CU employers who recruit at CU. Um, and then also Handshake also has within the system, not only jobs and internship postings and jobs for getting ready to graduate, graduating students, as well as new grads, middle, uh, mid, um, mid range and senior level positions, entry level, mid senior level positions on there. And there are resources on that. One of which is called Going Global. Going global, going, not going global, going global, which is a great resource and I could speak more on that, but I won't because I don't have time. So <laughs> um, another question came in real quick, my tray. Uh, this came in from Kurt. Did you ever connect with the people at Baj, it's either Baja or Bajaj School and Rickshaws? No, we we didn't um that was something a connection we were trying to establish but 
Bajaj is probably the largest auto rickshaw manufacturer. Um, and so it was really hard to figure out. And, you know, we were college students. We had no idea how to <laughs> navigate a corporate environment. And so um, we we didn't make connections there. Um, we did make connections with people at Tata, um, but it wasn't something that we necessarily, I guess, utilized. Um, I think that the resource we utilized most was honestly working with that university um, that we partnered with um, to really get that on the ground understanding of, of how to go about doing what we were doing. Could I just add one more one more um, point? Uh, don't forget the Peace Corps because the Peace Corps offers tremendous opportunities to not only know another country, language, and experience a whole, uh, just they used to say the best job you'll ever have, um, but I think it's very important for whatever career goal you have as, as well. So that's a wonderful opportunity. Thanks, Gail. Absolutely. Yes, thank you so much for mentioning that. Peace Corps, study abroad. I've had many students and alumni tell me that that was a real turning point for them, a real eye opener for them and uh, pivotal in their career paths. So um, I think we might have time for one more question. Um, Was there a specific moment when you decided that this was the work you had to do, a light bulb mo moment or an aha moment, so to speak? And I'm going to let you jump in when you're ready. None of you will know the book, but it was called The Ugly American. And I decided that I wasn't going to be an ugly American. So I read the book a long time ago and decided then I was going to go out in the world and try to impact humanity. Um, so this is not related to the startup that I, I founded, but when I was in high school, um, you know, on one of my summer trips to India, um, I had the opportunity to work with my late grandmother who um, founded a school for people um, with hearing impairment, for, ch for children with hearing impairment um, that didn't have the financial resources um, to necessarily afford um, traditional education um, given, given their circumstances. And so um, I had the opportunity to teach them dance. I've been dancing since I was three. I'm very passionate about the arts as well. And um, just, I don't know, seeing the smiles on children's faces and just the pure joy um, of, of something as simple as dance, just getting them so excited. And it just, it made me honestly so happy. Um, <laughs> it sounds a little cheesy, but um, that, sort of work, um, that volunteer work um, really drove me towards a career where I was impacting the people that, that really appreciated those, those little things um, that really are what you end up kind of focusing on and, and remembering um, in life, I feel like. Um, those are kind of the moments. And so um, I, I really wanted to focus on, on helping those individuals, so. That's great, Maggie. I think I knew from a young age that I wanted to find a way to increase access to education for others, and I knew that was the purpose for my life, and I think this is largely shaped by being adopted from China and coming from a rural village and knowing how my life could have turned out a whole lot differently, and the people we seek to serve also have similar backgrounds, except I was able to achieve more opportunities and having access to education, whereas um, they don't because there is no school or they have to walk multiple miles to even get to the nearest one. And that's something that I took very seriously earlier on. And that's why I think it's important to support younger people too, to create um, solutions for the world, because I think that is the only way. And I think also, there are just more limitations too, because there are more people saying no than encouraging you to go for it. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably what shaped me to do this work. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we are right at time, so I'm, we're going to have to um, say our goodbyes, but before I, before we do, um, I, you know, and I want to respect the time of our panelists as well as our audience, but um, I'd like to first thank all of our panelists 
our incredible panelists for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to meet all of you and to hear your stories and hear, especially I love aha moments or those personal um, pivotal moments in our careers or in our lives. So thank you for sharing those things with us. Um, thank you to the audience for submitting those great questions. And uh, before you go, I want to announce that our next Forever Buff Spotlight event will be on September 30th. So mark your calendar, September 30th. We will feature Oscar nominated producer of the film Hunger Ward, Michael Sherman. And keep an eye out for future Forever Buff Spotlight, Spotlight events by visiting our website, which is colorado.edu slash alumni slash events. And follow us also on our social media channels at CU Boulder Alumni and at CU Heard. Thank you again to all of our partners for supporting and putting this program together. The goal of this, these events obviously is to build and maintain our connection to CU Boulder, and we hope that you will stay connected. So thank you all again and go Buffs! <laughs>